My name is Isabella Makuta. I'm the CEO of Maple Tree Africa. Um, we are management consultants working predominantly with clients in the infrastructure space. Um, I have spent the first decade of my career life in the freight and uh, passenger rail space and uh, borrowing the words of my uh, learned friend Tsepo uh, Hole at uh, GMA. Um, I may have left uh, the trains, but the trains uh, remain in my veins. So it is a unique uh, honor to welcome you all to this very first uh, rail uh, webinar. It is the rail uh, dialogue series brought to us by Aegis in South Africa in collaboration with the South African Institution of Civil Engineering. So what is this a real dialogue series about, you may very well ask. I think Einstein warned us that uh, we cannot solve the problems that we have with the same mindsets that created the problems. Um, so this platform really is about um, rethinking and reimagining uh, the future of rail transport in South Africa. We are used to strange expressions such as the more we change, the more we remain the same. I mean, what kind of depressed uh, mind would have come up with such uh, an expression? But we accept uh, those kinds of things. So uh, this platform, uh, the Rail Dialogue Series, is a platform for the rail industry. It is for people that love rail, for people that uh, believe in rail and believe in South Africa. It is a platform where great minds meet and uh, share best practices and experiences. And uh, in order to come up with actionable ideas that improve our sector, it is definitely not a chat uh, session where we just talk and, uh, and go away. It is something that we would want to ensure that um, people uh, come up with tangible, actionable ideas that help the industry to move forward. So you're going to hear this morning from uh, a number of eminent speakers uh, and experts in the rail industry, uh, both locally and internationally. So I encourage you, our audience, to engage the speakers during the Q&A session and also in the chat box uh, that is at your disposal. would like to know where you're logging in from and, uh, and would like to get your views as the webinar uh, goes on uh, this morning. I'm sure you'll agree with me that this webinar is indeed timely. Uh, it's timely because it coincides with a National Transport Week here in South Africa, National Transport Month rather. So we hope that today and, uh, and for the rest of the month, we'll be able to shed a spotlight uh, on the rail transport sector and highlight uh, pertinent and urgent issues that are uh, affecting the performance of this very important mode of transport, uh, which the economy depends on uh, for growth. So on this platform, uh, there are many of you uh, from across uh, the rail community. So we welcome you all. Uh, we've got transport policy makers, we've got uh, private and public sector leaders, we've got professionals, we've got practitioners, researchers, international experts, we've got many other uh, key stakeholders uh, in the rail industry. So welcome once again to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are all emerging out of the ravages of uh, and devastation of uh, the COVID pandemic. We have added pressure and agency to deliver um, economic growth, particularly infrastructure, which stimulates economic growth. We have to rebuild our economy. So as we grapple with the power outages of today, which are costing us billions as an economy, we in the rail sector have to confront our problems as well, which are besetting this economy and are coming at a huge cost. I'm sure you'll all agree. Africa is one of the fastest growing continents, according to the United Nations, and will account for about 50% growth of the world population by 2050. We're talking about 2 billion people. So with the kind of problems that we already have, and with that visioning growth, this will come with heightened demand for infrastructure capacity, roads, rail, water reticulation, housing, energy, food, so we are living really in an exponential world where the old solutions that we are, we are used to 
and the bureaucracy and the talk shops that don't translate into any quick actions, they will no longer do. We require divergent thinking today, new strategic approaches. We require courageous leaders that are decisive and are able to uh, listen to ideas from uh, different stakeholders and are able to create and implement game-changing solutions that will make this country and help this country move forward. So the rail industry series is exactly about that. It is a platform where like-minded people are going to congregate and it will stimulate innovative thinking, sharing of best practices and creation of implementable ideas uh, that will help the economy, as I have said. So it is about a platform where the private sector and the public sector collaborate to rebuild uh, this economy and our sector. So this is your platform. So we're here today to discuss a very important topic, to unpack it and to share ideas of how uh, we can tackle this. Our topic for this very first session is rail infrastructure asset management challenges and opportunities. I have no doubt that you, our audience, have a lot of questions, a lot of comments, and a lot of input. So we look forward to hearing from you, and most importantly, to hearing from uh, our panelists. We would like to really hear what they have to, to say. So with all that, I would like us to kick off this discussion uh, by welcoming one of uh, the gentleman that is very familiar in the infrastructure space for over 20 years. Many of you know Laurent Boschakot. He is the CEO of Aegis in South Africa and country manager. And uh, we are pleased to welcome you, Laurent. And uh, thank you very much for this initiative and uh, in collaboration with SAISI. And uh, we hope that the journey that has begun today will help us to move forward as a sector. Over to you, Laurent. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Isabella, and thank you to all the moderators, our distinguished uh, guests, and our partners from uh, SAISI. A very warm welcome on behalf of uh, Aegis uh, in South Africa. Uh, my role is going to be to share for the next few minutes uh, some uh, initial thoughts on the relevance of Aegis in that particular space and the type of uh, in input that we we aim to to share in terms of that discussion around uh, the re-energizing of the uh, rail sector in South Africa. Um, what I'd like to uh, give you as a form of background and again is who are we for those who are not already entirely familiar with, with Aegis. We are a global uh, leader in infrastructure development. I think that's the main trait. Uh, we are really involved across the full life cycle from inception all the way to uh, development operations, all the way to asset management, including um, advisory, all the way down to uh, complex projects like, like PPPs. So we have that distinct uh, feature of, of having been exposed for now over 50 years to a diversity of uh, project structuring. So that gives us a bit of a 360 and pro probably additional legitimacy in the conversation uh, today. As you can see on the top right corner of my, of my slide, one distinct trait of our company is that we very much, we've got a very strong DNA uh, in terms of uh, road and rail infrastructure. We're probably one of the top five uh, globally. So I think that's another uh, element that uh, reinforces the, the 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 quality of the contributions today is the ability to tap into uh, a diversity of projects that we've developed over a long period of time. Significantly, again, it's really our ability to uh, be involved at all stages of development of uh, most types of uh, transport infrastructure uh, from all walks of life, and I think on aggregate that's creating a stock uh, inventory of assets and experience that uh, is uh, feeding today some of the lessons learned and some of the best practice we would like to uh, share in that open forum uh, with you. Uh, as we said, a very global player in as far as uh, our presence in Africa it goes back over five decades and uh, we uh, recently in South Africa uh, two years ago opened uh, an office uh, mostly centered around operation and maintenance and PPPs, but we are also uh, again 
as uh, Isabella introduced it in an uh, opening remark, uh, have committed uh, as early as last week again that we will um, make significant, uh, significant inroads in the engineering space uh, very shortly as uh, Africa and South Africa have been uh, identified as uh, very key growth areas uh, for uh, for the group. So again, incremental capacity and again in South Africa history uh, of um, uh, sharing with communities, a lot of corporate social investment initiatives. It's really about like today uh, sharing. It's uh, sowing before you reap. It's really about uh, uh, building connections, partnerships and uh, with like minded people. And we believe that it's uh, with that sort of approach that we can collectively find uniquely South African solutions to our problems, but yet tapping into uh, global press uh, best practices. Uh, well, I think centrally, as far as rail is concerned, if we zero in a little bit more on that on that segment, it's a very important uh, um, area of expertise of the group, and it cuts across all form of of uh, rail segments from light rail, mass rapid transit, the more conventional railways, high speeds, even uh, uh, through the development of uh, uh, of cable cars in uh, in urban environments. So it's out of that, again, that inventory of, of projects past and present that we were able to cherry pick some um, case studies that we felt uh, would be uh, of interest today. Uh, I invite you again to browse our experience specifically on the, the, the in the rail space, and we'll make that information available, uh, but really from uh, uh, start to finish, we are able to uh, engage with uh, the rail community in, in, in different formats. Um, why asset management as a first uh, a point of, of talk today? Uh, I think we really believe that asset management is uh, central to our rail asset performance and, and availability across the life cycle. And performance and availability are really, really, really uh, topical and so crucial uh, in the South African context, but also uh, post-COVID with um, uh, pressures on fiscals, on on on, uh, on riderships, and I think asset management has never been as uh, central and as relevant as it is uh, today. And I think because we take a long-term view on our assets, our partnerships, and our position in projects, I think asset management is certainly one of the areas uh, where we can add the most uh, the most value. My colleagues will elaborate on that. And then lastly, why did we choose that particular format? Um, our colleagues have for many, many years developed pl that platform called uh, the Rail Academy, uh, which is a platform that we use in different ways uh, and that enables us to keep always our fingers on the pulse with the market, with public stakeholders, with uh, industry experts. It can be on technical subject matters to make sure we all re you know, remain relevant. We all know what we, we we don't know what we don't know. So it's really important to cross pollinate information between the public and the private sector. And also, uh, we are building partnership with institutions of higher learning in South Africa. Some of those guests are actually uh, also attending this particular event today. So we are trying to find a translation to uh, the uh, Railway Academy uh, concept, which is very central to our uh, Aegis DNA not only through webinars like, like this one today, but hopefully uh, in 2023 uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 a, in a variety of ways uh, to ensure that we uh, contribute in small yet meaningful way to increasing the, the, the pool of skills and expertise and best practices uh, in, in, in South Africa amongst the, the, the various um, 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 you know, railway stakeholders in, in, in that market. And again, uh, Hoping that the uh, features today in terms of the uh, case studies give you a sense of, of, of uh, positivity. We want to approach uh, the topic in a positive way. That's why we framed it that way and that the problem statement is actually solutions oriented. And we believe that our challenges are not unique. There are solutions available. If we can make a small contribution towards um, uh, easing the trans transition between the policy framework and uh, effective implementation, we'd be very glad to have played that uh, that uh, contribution. Uh, and we hope you find uh, this event uh, fruitful and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, we have a very packed morning and uh, time is not on our side. Um, so we will move on and uh, thank Laurent for that uh, introduction that gives us a sense what uh, of what Aegis is about. It is a huge group and uh, one of the leading infrastructure groups, as, as many of you will know. So I would like to move on and introduce uh, one of the leaders in our industry, a lady that is well known to most of us. I indicated earlier that uh, this rail uh, dialogue series is a partnership between Aegis in South Africa and the South African Institution of Civil Engineering. So I am pleased and honored to uh, introduce to you the president uh, of SAISI, uh, Professor Marian. Uh, over to you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All protocol observed. Um, it is really my pleasure to address address you from Cape Town this morning. For people in the room that do not know SICE or do not know SICE well, SICE, the South African Institution of Civil Engineering, um, has a mission as a learned society where we are um, distributed into branches and divisions. And uh, the divisions includes the Rail and Harbour Division, which is in the room. The branches are more local and we have a few panels as well. I don't want to unpack SICE more in more detail because most of the people in the room know SICE very well and are very active in our structures. As a transport engineer, I'm very excited to see the agenda this morning. The speakers that come from close and afar. Myself, trainers and transport engineer, I can still, still remember some of the dimensions I had to learn by heart on the rail infrastructure. I do think this will be a fruitful event and rail is definitely one of the important and most efficient modes to transport persons and goods. Rail is efficient and environmentally friendly. Just looking up some numbers, one double stacked train can approximately hold the same amount of freight as 280 trucks. And those 280 trucks on the South African roads that were not built for the heavy trucks that we have today will encounter a lot of damage to our road network. So let's keep freight on rail. If we look at the transportation of persons, I did do a back of the envelope calculation a few years ago. Um, we see that one standard eight carriage train set will transport as many people as 100 minibus taxis. 100 extra minibus taxis on our road network will mean more congestion, more pollution and more road crashes. So we definitely need to make sure that rail does go back to playing its important role that it has in the past in this country. Rail also lasts almost forever. In this country, we know it's not forever, but we have many rail systems around the world that are well over 100 years old. On the 26th of June, 1860, Durban was a bus implementing the first rail in South Africa. Rail is generally less fragile than road and also more reliable when operated well. However, in the South African context, we know that we have some challenges. Rail suffers from theft of freight on rail, personal security issues for users, vandalism of carriages and infrastructure, and we have a maintenance backlog. Just to share some recent data with you, if we look at people walking to and from stations, they generally feel unsafe, and that feeling 
has deteriorated. Where in 2013, 56% of people were dissatisfied with security to and from stations. In 2020, that became 71%. These numbers are just unacceptable and something needs to be done. On a positive note, we have the white paper on the national rail policy that was released in March this year. And I think on the back end of this and with seminars and dialogues, as we are conducting this morning, we can turn the rail industry in this country around. So I wish you all the best for this dialogue. Forgive me if I cannot stay the whole time. I do have another uh, obligation in about an hour. So I will quietly leave the room when that is the case. Until then, I will be listening in and are looking forward to what I'm hearing. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you so, so much, Professor Lerian. And uh, I'm sure that uh, everyone in the room appreciates uh, the person that you are and everything that you represent. We are truly encouraged to begin this uh, webinar on the note that you have set for us. So uh, thank you so much once again. I will hasten to introduce the next speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, he's also from SAISI. We have heard uh, from the president of SAISI. Now we're going to hear from the chair of rail and harbors desk at, at SAISI, uh, Mr. Janil Bowen. Uh, Janine, over to you. Thank you and um, good morning, everybody. Um, am I audible? You are. So, thank you for this opportunity to do this presentation. Uh, as per the program, um, I'll be dis discussing some of the challenges we are facing in South Africa um, and, and, and in the rail sector. So just to provide a bit of background to myself, I'm a civil engineer and began my career in railway construction and maintenance and progressed to manage railway maintenance and construction team and contracts. I then con transitioned into the engineering design space and worked as a civil and, and rail engineer for a number of years. So yeah, I'm going to start off with, with a brief history of the South African Railways and provide a bit of um, context and overview of rail operators in the space. I'll then um, discuss some of the infrastructure challenges um, we are facing um, and end off with some opportunities in the space. So the first um, railway lines uh, goes back uh, to the mid 1980s, predominantly in the coastal towns of Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. Um, in 1860, the point to Durban railway line was um, was established, um, and in 1863, the Cape to Wellington line was was built. In the late 1800s, uh, you know, short railway lines were built in the Witwatersrand area to service the you know developing mining industry steam locomotives were actually still used back then um, and not long after that around the 1890s the cape to johannesburg line was was opened in 1910 there was an amalgamation of the uh, natal cape and central south african railways um, and it formed like the first public railway in south africa which we now know today as transit freight rail the 1920s saw the rise of the electric locomotives, and the following 100 years saw tremendous um, development in our South African railway system from a network and um, technological perspective. So we can roughly categorize South African uh, railways into two components, the freight rail network and the passenger network. The freight rail network is predominantly owned by state-owned company Transnet, who owns about 30 or 1,000 kilometers of track spread across, across the country. Um, of this, there's around 21,000 uh, route kilometers, which has a 60% split in, in main lines and 40% um, in its branch lines. Um, in addition, uh, 1,500 kilometers of its core network comprises of the heavy haul lines. So that's your coal line from Ermelo to Richards Bay, 
uh, and your iron ore line from um, Sishin to Saldana. The passenger rail network of South Africa, Prasa, is also state owned um, and owns most of the country's passenger rail network. They operate predominantly in the metropolitan areas of KwaZulu Natal, Western Cape, and, and Gauteng. Um, and you, I mean, obviously, we know Gauteng, which is our high speed rail uh, passenger network, which um, provides um, an additional mode of transport uh, to commuters in Gauteng. How train, however, is not state owned but forms part of a public uh, private partnership. And last but certainly not least, we have our railway safety regulator, which regulates the safety of our country's rail operates, um, operations and uh, performs a very um, important function. So the image on the right shows the extent of our rail uh, network and it's taken from Transnet's rail development plan. So my, my upcoming slides are going to come as, cover some of the infrastructure challenges experienced in the rail sector. I must add that um, what I'm presenting is, is a high level overview and includes problems that I've come across personally while working in the space. Um, research that I've conducted, you know, what I have observed in the media or in the public space, as well as discussions with other technical and operational personnel, um, you know, that work at some of these entities. So uh, theft and vandalism is, 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 is one of our major issues. I'm sure many have noticed either by working for rail operators or a, a client of an operator supplier or, you know, really anywhere along the value chain, or, or even read about it in the media that, you know, the last few years, especially three years, there's been severe theft and vandalism of um, Transnet and process infrastructure. How train hasn't suffered as severely though. Um, I think there's a local and global demand for copper and other metals, and this has created sophisticated criminal organizations that target these entities and steal the infrastructure. Um, so, and this causes a host of negative impacts and ultimately affects uh, service delivery. Firstly, um, you know, you have immediate train delays and um, which, um, you know, and you can't transport your goods and passengers safely. Um, the stolen or, or vandalized infrastructure will have to be repaired or replaced, which means the train lines would, would have to be closed. Um, trains may perhaps need to be rerouted where possible or wait on the line to be reopened. In some cases, you know, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, parts or space availability may be difficult to access, which, for, which further causes delays. Um, and this COVID, uh, the spare, you know, the supply chain issue is, is a global issue, especially since COVID has had a huge impact on, you know, supply chains globally. Um, some of process operations and stations were shut down during you know, the early parts of the pandemic due to, due to government regulations, resulting in some of the stations being left uh, empty and abandoned, which created, you know, further opportunities for theft and vandalism. Um, in, in, in addition, many people suffered um, from job cuts, which, which may have further worsened the problem. The image on the right uh, was taken from the Daily Maverick and shows, you know, Clifton train station. It was very sad for me to see. I remember as you know, a kid growing up quite vividly, um, this being a, a you know well-functioning bu bustling station. So yeah, that's some of the challenges that you're facing. So the railway safety regulator, the 2020-2021 report, um, indicated that uh, you know our overall network, rail network uh, traffic reduced by 53% since 2010 and 2011. Um, um, however, operational occurrences per train million uh, kilometers decreased by only 3%. However, security related incidents per train million kilometer as well increased dramatically by 240%. Um, other in incidences and occurrences are still important to note, uh, but I just wanted to highlight, uh, the, you know, the, the, the the theft and vandalism issue um, and property damage, you know, for 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 all operators, specifically Transnet and and um, and Prasa. Another issue that we're facing um, are maintenance maintenance backlogs and and breakdowns. 
both transit and prasa have a maintenance backlog resulting in breakdowns, which is you know an, an ongoing problem for both entities. It's not an easy problem to fix, you know, as maintenance and rehabilitation of assets are, are done during movement of trains. Replacement of old and, and outdated equipment also causes operational issues, either due to breakdowns caused by equipment failure, you know, as it's as it's used beyond its its um, design life, or old equipment that can't be configured to to new technologies. Ultimately, the result is an unreliable and, and service and which uh, decreases client satisfaction. In many occurrences, train movements are prioritized over maintenance, and this is ultimately, um, it reduces the asset's lifespan um, and results in, in early breakdown or failure. I show the image on the right of the slide, uh, which was taken once again from the Railway Safety Regulator Report um, to further highlight, you know, Captain Vandalism and, and, and this also causes train delays due to breakdowns and maintenance backlogs. So, you know, it's it's further worsens the problems. Um, so I haven't spoken about some of the challenges. I must say the rail environment is extremely complex and the problems presented here are not easy to fix. And it's not the only problems we are facing. Um, and it certainly can't be fixed, you know, overnight. There are a number of considerations to make. Um, there's various stakeholders to consider and, and, and as well as local and global factors. Transnet um, is, is certainly uh, impacted by global demand for, com for commodities, um, as well as price fluctuations, shipping routes and port capacity, as well as customer needs, both at, at the supply and demand point of view um, along the value chain. Um, and, you know, it also needs to consider capacity of its system to name a few. So I've, I've mentioned um, some of, um, you know, the challenges we are facing, but I want to highlight some of our success stories and discuss some of opportunities that we have. So we can proudly say in South Africa that we are a big player in the heavy oil market. South Africa now runs the world's largest and heaviest train. The, on the 860 kilometer session to Saldana Line. In 2019, Transnet ran the 375 wagon, four kilometer long train from session to Saldana. This, I must say, is not the first record that we've broken in the heavy oil space, and I certainly don't think it will be the last. You know, and obviously we have our beloved cow train. It's our success story as well. Sometimes I sit in traffic and uh, I'm on the highway and I see the, you know, the, the woody billboards. It always brings a smile to my face, you know, and I wonder why I'm not sitting in the cow train. You know, I guess if I was, I wouldn't be able to see the, the funny billboards. Um, anyway, um, so looking at the legal and environmental factors, um, both on a global and, and, and local level, you know, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. Our roads, both at the metropolitan level and, you know, along major transport uh, routes are congested. Um, there's been a lot of discussion uh, about our rail to roads migration and strategy, and I, for, I foresee this creating more opportunities for our rail industry. We have some of the best engineering professionals, operational personnel, strategic planners, and other rail related professionals in South Africa. We have worked on large scale and complex projects and also operate complex rail systems. Um, you know, we, we also have uh, access to a global network and can learn from, from others. Uh, I, I mean, I can assure you some of the challenges that we are facing are, are not unique to South Africa. So the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition also plans to build a new rail corridor between Houting and, and Eastern Cape. And that's to help reduce congestion at, at Durban Sports. Um, and, and this line is, is aimed at vehicle uh, manufacturers in the Tsoane uh, Automotive SEZ. Uh, that's your special economic zone. We already know that Ford, um, the vehicle manufacturer, has invested 16 billion rand towards this um, SEZ and other component manufacturers and suppliers an, an additional 4 billion rand. Government has put forward um, to date uh, around 2.5 billion rand towards this uh, SEZ. Um, in March this year, for the first time in South Africa, um, Cabinet have approved a draft white paper on national rail policy, 
which you know creates a level of certainty regarding policy and structural reforms in the rail sector. In addition, the paper covers topics such as carbon emissions, uh, rapid rail transit, public-private partnerships, um, you know, uh, to improve reliability and network stability. Ultimately, we're working to a more competitive uh, rail sector by opening up our network to, to other players in the market. All things being equal, I can only see this as, as a positive. You know, it also mentions uh, integration into the African market. Uh, to enhance trade and industrialization and scale our product offerings through our rail network um, and, and ultimately to, to reduce waste. In terms of passenger rail, the paper recognizes that, you know, an integrated transport system has rail as its, as its cornerstone. And, and, you know, this is really needed to address many of the difficulties our most vulnerable citizens face day to day with a daily commute. Um, it takes into account concessions as well, private sector participation. It also recognizes integration of other policy um, documents such as the National Infrastructure Plan 2050, the Integrated Urban Development Framework, and the National Land Transport Act. Uh, the DPWI said that by 2050, freight transport should facilitate domestic and cross-border movement of goods to enable industrialization, diversification, diversification, trade and development. The NDP uh, further discusses key points to revolutionize the, the sector, such as global competitiveness, uh, sustainable sector reform, a, a competitive market structure, scalability, funding and finance. So um, this brings me to the, you know, the end of my presentation. I must say that I've only scratched the surface um, of my talking points. Uh, there's still an, uh, an abundance of information out there, and um, there are many other experts and, and well who are well versed in regarding this topic. Um, so you know, we look forward to future discussions. Well, thank you very much. Well, let us thank uh, Janil for. Uh, comprehensive discussion within a very short space of time. Uh, we know that you were pressured with time and could have shared more with us. Uh, but this is the beginning of a of a long-term conversation that we will have as an industry, and this is not the end of this discussion. Um, I would like to highlight that uh, there are people that are waiting in the lobby, so if we could just let those people in uh, the uh, our tech department I uh, would really appreciate that. Um, we would now like to get into the Q&A Q &A section. Before we do that, um, I would like to ask the team to put up the, the poll question uh, that we have for you this morning. Um, we all know that there was, uh, there's been a launch of the, of the white paper uh, on the on, on rail uh, in March this year. So the question that we have for you, with all these policy developments, uh, the national rail policy, the national infrastructure plan, and measures to attract uh, private investments, uh, are you optimistic about uh, South Africa and the measures that are being taken? So there is a poll on the right hand side. Uh, if you could please uh, participate in the poll, and uh, we also would like to warn you that some of your organizations may not permit uh, this type of, uh, of app. So uh, don't be disappointed if you can't participate, but you may quickly get your IT department to help in that regard. So join the conversation. Uh, this is your forum, and uh, we want to hear yes from the presenters, but we would most of all like to hear from you as the important role players in this important industry. I would like uh, to introduce a uh, son of the soil who is known uh, to many of us in the industry who actually needs no introduction to, to handle the next section of our discussion. We are going to take your uh, questions and uh, there will be answers from, uh, from the speakers and also answers from some of you in the house. Uh, I'd like to at this stage introduce uh, Tsebo Hole. He is uh, the COO at GMA, the How Train, and uh, he's a man that is known uh, for very many success stories. Uh, 
right from metro rail uh, into how train and many multidisciplinary projects that he's been uh, responsible for over the past 22 years. I cannot do justice to your resume, Otsepo, so you will forgive me and I will bank the rest for the next section and it will be richer next time. So over to you to assist us with the next segment, which is the Q&A and also facilitating the case studies from our international audience and speakers. Thank you, Thank Isabella, you. and the kind introduction. Um, I come, as you say, with no need for an introduction. Um, I was happy to hear from Janil. Janil, just one uh, minor adjustment to the things that were said. Uh, the health train is actually owned by the um, South African government through the province of Gauteng. It, it is not a, a, a private asset, it is actually owned by the state. Um, but um, having that said, and I was also happy to see that one of my greatest projects that I've ever, ever run, uh, the extensions of the loops on the Session Saldana line, actually is yielding new um, outcomes that are, are, are better than what we had intended at that point in time. So with that, I think my role here is very simple and is for me to introduce the speakers that have to come up. Um, next, we have two presentations uh, from Jerome Grange, uh, an asset management expert from Aegis. And Jerome has an academic background, you know, in risk management uh, as an engineer. And he has since the beginning of his career uh, managed safety and quality in various rail systems. But he has spent a lot of time in with industrial manufacturers uh, contributing to you know various network you know LRTs and rail network both in France and abroad and he has worked both with public and private companies and he brings with him a whole lot of experience um Jerome will be talking to us uh, on the um, Greater Toulouse Transport Authority uh, moving towards asset management excellence. And then he will then indulge us on how he has assisted the Riyadh uh, Transport Authority on the driverless metro and the uh, network that he has worked on. Uh, Jerome, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure for me uh, to be here today to share this uh, to share the, these two um, case study. Excuse me, just a second. I have to share these documents. Up. Oh. I hope you can see my slide. So this is a great uh, pleasure to, to share these two experiences uh, that uh, I had the opportunity to, to work on uh, in France and in uh, South Africa uh, and to share with you, uh, in, um, sorry, uh, yeah, that I had in, uh, in France and in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And it's a great uh, pleasure to share, to share it with the South African uh, rail industry. Uh, thanks also to the South African Institution of uh, Civil Engineering for giving, me, giving us the opportunity uh, to share to share these this case studies. Um, I'm not used to always speak in English, so I hope you will be uh, you will understand if in some time it's not uh, easy for me. Um, so the first case study uh, we wanted to present to you uh, today. Uh, which is, uh, I think, a very good uh, example of uh, implementing uh, an asset management framework within an organization uh, dedicated to uh, passenger transport, is um, an, assist an assistance that Aegis is providing to uh, the Greater Toulouse Transport Authority uh, to implement them a risk-based asset management process. Quickly, I will present the Greater Toulouse Transport Network. Um, today, this is quite a big network for, for France, uh, as Toulouse uh, uh, is the fifth city in France. And there are actually two metro lines uh, and one, uh, one of uh, in construction uh, in construction. And the first line was commissioned in the 1993 and the second one in 2007. Uh, 
as uh, you can consider with this age of assets, uh, the Toulouse Transport Authority is now is now facing big challenges because we are talking of uh, infrastructures that are going to have between 20 and 30 years, and they have a lot of challenges to face uh, with obsolescence and renewal uh, management. There are also two uh, light rail lines uh, commissioned in uh, 2010 and 2015. And here again, uh, we are beginning to, to enter in the stages where rail renewal and over uh, asset management uh, issues are beginning to appear. We have first seven stations of Metro, 28 of trams, and uh, more than 100 uh, million passengers for the Metro a year and almost 20 for the, for the light rail. All this asset portfolio added with the buses uh, makes that the TCO collectivity, which is the Greater Toulouse uh, Transport Authority, as um, an asset portfolio of more than uh, 3.1 billion euros. Uh, these are 2014 uh, figures, but I think it's important to also understand that this portfolio is going to be more than uh, or almost 5 billion euros in the three coming years because of the new metro line. So as in most organization, it is uh, quite difficult to uh, gain both financement for the management of the existing asset and the extension of the network. I think this is the typical uh, challenge issue that all the asset owners are facing when they are uh, when they have extension projects. And in that way, it is very important to implement a clear asset management framework because uh, the people in charge in charge of the existing asset will be uh, each time more challenged by uh, the, the politician, the local politician, uh, to, to explain and demonstrate why they need uh, some financement to maintain the existing asset in condition, while uh, usually the more visible part of the financement of the finance needs is for the new line. So for that, the Transport Authority of Toulouse asked us to implement a, a short term, a robust process for asset condition assessment and helping them to uh, build a multi-year investment planning, which will be uh, aligned with international industry best practices to help them to be able to detect uh, and communicate and mitigate asset related risk. And I will say, insist on communicate. It means to share with the, uh, all the stakeholders what are the needs and how are they linked with the organizational strategic objectives in terms of safety, service quality, finance, and other regulatory uh, issues. A quick overview of, of this uh, asset management framework could be summarized in could be summarized in this slide. The the, the framework that we implemented uh, can be summarized in three steps. The first one is about uh, assessing the asset condition. We we developed with the Toulouse Transport Authority a robust framework to um, assess if the assets are in a condition that allow them to perform the expected functions and, the, and if they are still valid uh, for uh, to, to provide the transport services or if they need renewal or, um, or over asset management uh, actions. Then once the asset condition is assessed, uh, we uh, can consider that some of the assets uh, um, make a rise risk for the uh, organization. It means that they will not allow the organization to reach its objectives. And in that case, we have to uh, uh, define the, the action to uh, mitigate the asset related risks. And then once these actions are defined, we have to plan them in the time, we have to prioritize them. Uh, and this is the way that then we will be able or to update the maintenance plan 
for example, some of the action regarding um, asset condition could be to make a more detailed inspection to have a better overview on this um, on the asset uh, condition and to follow some uh, condition issues. So it will be maintenance plan, which are usually uh, financed through operational expenditures. But in some cases, we have to go through obsolescence and renewal programs which means that we, we will have to look for capital expenditures and uh, go to the local politicians to, to justify them that, OK, we need the, this money because this asset, which is critical for the service quality, is uh, as an obsolescence pro problem and must be uh, changed or uh, managed. And then in the pro in the um, we also uh, look with our customers if there are needs for performance and improvement. Uh, as we are launching um, asset management projects. What I would like to emphasize is that this process, which is quite typical, all these uh, three steps, uh, is improved by uh, the industry best practices in asset management. I mean that um, when defining the decision support framework, uh, we established um, a strategic asset management plan as requested by uh, industry best practices in asset management and the ISO 55000 standards that uh, my colleague David will present you uh, after. And it means that based on the Transport Authority strategic objectives, which are quality of service, in that case safety, compliance with regulation and the reputation, this decision support framework should help us to better assess the asset condition and then to better prioritize the, um, the uh, mitigation uh, action to be implemented and then to better schedule the, the, the asset management actions. So for that reason, we have to go to a very pragmatic uh, asset management framework uh, to help the authority to quickly be able to perform these three steps and make it in a repeatable way. I mean that each time that they will uh, asset, assess the condition of the asset, uh, they should do it in the same way, in the same way, then they should prioritize in the same way and schedule it in the same way because this is how the stakeholders will gain confidence on the process uh, implemented within the transport uh, authority. And obviously, um, last but not least, we have to have a good uh, a good knowledge of what are the assets. And in many org organizations, this is the third challenge to be addressed. Uh, I mean, uh, building a robust asset register that will help us to uh, record the information about this process and um, be sure that we address all the all the assets. Some uh, some overview of, of what is uh, of the step one assessing asset condition. Uh, the objective is to define the criti to perform a criticity assessment for each asset, and uh, it means as before. And I think that is is the really the an important thing to record uh, is that uh, industry best practices asset management means alignment. Alignment between uh, the knowledge that I have uh, from this asset and my strategic objectives. So each asset must be assessed against the asset management objectives that are defined by the authority. For that, we use a critical a criticity criticality matrix with a criticality score, which will be calculated by combining the asset condition index that you can see here. Uh, the asset could be in excellent, good, bad, or totally or inadequate condition. And the severity of the consequences that this, uh, the degradation or failure of the asset will have on the objectives. It means, will I cause a major, very, uh, a very a major delay of several days or weeks on the line? Will it be uh, a delay of something like uh, a few hours? Um, are we just talking about um, a reduced delay or something which will be marginal, only maybe a lack of information to the people? So if an asset can provoke such uh, um, uh, an important consequence and is in a, needed, in a bad state, uh, a bad state, sorry, 
it will be scored here on the matrix. Over will be scored there and so on. And then it will be the first step to help us to prioritize what do I have to uh, do first? And as I told before, to share it with the stakeholders to say, OK, if I'm asking uh, finance man today is because I have asset here. I am not um, asking about Financement uh, that just came out because uh, we think it, it will be interesting. No, it is because regarding your objective, we have, a, a, for example, 15% of our asset portfolio, which is in a totally unacceptable state. And if we want to, to keep on providing uh, the transport service, we have to act now. Uh, I'll go very quickly, but here we we use we use to to um, to use a mobile on-site data collection and asset condition monitoring app to to help us to collect the data and enter in this process. But I'm going uh, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'll pass quickly on that. Step two. For for we 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 do not have to use a um, very complex system. Uh, complex IT system for asset management exists, but in an organization where we we need quick wins, uh, in most cases we have to use quite simple uh, quite simple uh, tools at the beginning, and then with a medium term and long term uh, view. We 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 could uh, we could implement more specific. Um, more specific tools as Martin will uh, be able to, to to present at the uh, in uh, in um, the fourth case studies. We define access plan and we we sort the thing and then uh, regarding what we will gain in terms of criticality and what will be the cost we are able to plan and to prioritize these uh, these actions. And then we help the authority to to um, to to build their capital plan uh, with a, at a eight year or ten year or fifteen year horizon uh, to to help them to have the the good input for their finance uh, finance um, finance constraints uh, or finance and budgeting. Sorry. Uh, and uh, they will be able to uh, update the maintenance policy to ensure the asset portfolio sustainability and the, the classical financial financial constraints that we used to have. Uh, if I could provide you some uh, free takeaways about uh, this uh, this presentation, so. We considered and we 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 learned uh, with our clients that establishing a clear asset management decision framework um, must be aligned on strategic objective of the uh, authority to get this line of sights and this alignment between asset management and uh, strategic objectives. Applying a risk-based approach uh, will help us to balance asset condition risk planning constraints and budget, and it is very important to discuss with the stakeholders. And here again, to discuss with the stakeholders, uh, document and share uh, your asset management practice will encourage transparency and will help you to uh, discuss with the stakeholders your asset management needs. Thank you, Jerome, um, and thank you for that insightful presentation. Um, while I'm waiting for to see if I've got any hands, I think I can probably hear the people there and in their minds they're going, well, assuming I have an asset register, where do I start if I were to start up a, a what do they call it, a, an asset management uh, framework? Um, just your thoughts on that, you know, assuming, you yeah. know, as I said, you, that you have an asset register because that might be a bit of a challenge somewhere else, but yeah. uh, assuming that you do have one. so. So if you already have an asset register, this is very good, good, uh, good point because it's a big uh, hard work to hard work to do. Um, I think that then uh, the the next step will be to establish the um, de the decision support uh, framework, and for that you will have to you will have to work on two two streams. The first one, which which seems uh, easy easy, but is not so so much, is to define the um, strategic objective of your organization that are related with the asset. But not just defining that, but uh, working within your organization to be sure that at all level we share what are our objectives and what are their priority. 
uh, how should I compare service quality with my image, my brand image, or with uh, some um, some uh, regulatory or, su or sustainability uh, objectives? I have to make this framework, which will be like a grid, I think. Uh, what are my objectives and what is catastrophic, if I cannot, uh, what is a catastrophic event regarding this objective? What is uh, um, an, uh, an event with middle consequences and what is an event with low consequences? This work uh, is already, I think, weeks or a few months, but it is very important because it makes that the people begin to speak together about what is our objectives and how our asset that we have in these uh, beautiful asset registers, how do they contribute with that? This is the first step of aligning assets and objectives, and it helps, I think, the people to gain this first step of maturity. Then, over a stream will be asset condition, okay? We all perform asset condition, we all contract um, entities to assess the condition of our assets. But in some cases, in, some, in, in, in a lot of cases, what we have are something that are quite um, different from what uh, one people will say about uh, the condition of, for example, an electrical substation, what the maintenance team could feel about that, and uh, what a, a third party could also uh, uh, say about the condition of, for example, this power substation. So I need to have a clear framework of what, at what at what time my power substation is not in an acceptable condition and I have to act uh, to manage this asset through renewal, obsolescence and so on. These two frameworks are very important because these are the pillars of your uh, decision making process. And I think that a lot of uh, asset management projects forget that or, or uh, uh, lead these activities to be done by people uh, in silo, you know, that, uh, for example, the asset management team will work alone on, on this framework, but this is not the point. The point is to make it and to ensure that this is shared within the organization, because this is how we create the first step of the asset management culture, which will be in my mind um, uh, quite uh, inevitable to have uh, a good asset management policy. Thank you, Jerome. Um, do we have any questions from the floor or from the uh, the chat as uh, as a whole? Um, okay, somebody's asking about you know vandalism and what was the best way to uh, protect assets from from theft. Um, I don't know if you've got that much experience about that, Jerome, uh, and your thoughts from a risk based approach. Uh, I don't have much experience on that on that field in particular, but in the um, in the risk-based approach, yes, uh, theft and vandalism is a is is a risk uh, that could be entered. And here again, uh, we could see that the the, the asset uh, we could differentiate the assets that are exposed to theft and vandalism regarding their uh, consequences on the on the transport service. But in my opinion, test and and vandalism is not so much uh, about risk-based asset management, uh, but first, uh, the first uh, way to um, to work on it could be about maintenance organization, because it could lead to, uh, for example, um, uh, different uh, spares calculation, because usually we have spare calculation by the manufacturers, which are very theoretical and do not take into account theft and vandalism. And if I am on a network, which uh, I could see, I worked in Morocco uh, on, a, on a rail network, and they also had a very big uh, issues with uh, the, the copper robbery. And the first action that we took was about, OK, to have some stocks and to have them the closer from the vandalism to be able to, uh, to, to, to restore the service as soon as possible, hoping that we will not be get uh, theft or, not, or spares. <laughs> Thank you, Jerome. Um, I think we are out of the echo. We will continue with more questions as they come through on, on, on the chat box. Uh, I'd like to uh, continue with 
my ability to operate on time, uh, you know, yeah. as the chief operating officer of the How Train. Uh, let me try and do that. Um, we will go to the next presentation, but do not hold your questions back as we continue with what they call it with the, uh, with the conversation. Um, we are looking forward to you bringing on your uh, your que uh, your questions. Um, and I see the, that that uh, Prof Mariana has just left and we thank her for being with us in this part of what they call it of, of, of the conversation. Let's go to the next conversation on the uh, Riyadh Metro project and the case study itself. Um, Jerome, back to you. Great. Okay. Th thank you very much. So I will follow with another case studies, uh, which uh, I think um, is the, the, is like um, sounds logical after the, the the first one. The first one was about establishing um, uh, an asset management decision framework by the transport authority, but obviously the transport authority, the asset owner, uh, does not have all the um, uh, all the means needed to manage this asset, its asset. He has to work with the operator and maintainers, uh, entities or, or contractors. And um, obviously it means that within the operation and maintenance procurement process, we will have to include um, requirements about uh, asset management. Uh, this is quite important, but also quite um, delicate because we uh, we cannot, the owner cannot delegate all the asset management um, responsibility to the uh, to the operation and maintenance unless it, it will have a very, very uh, long term contract. But uh, some of the activities shall anyway be performed by the operator and maintainers. So I will present you after in this uh, in this case studies the way we try to structure it as clearly as possible and um, uh, to 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 not have ambiguity about what are the responsibility of the uh, maintainer regarding asset management and uh, in mirror what are the responsibility of the asset owner uh, in regard to asset management. So this is a case which uh, we delivered for the uh, Riyadh Transport Authority, for uh, which is going to commission and to have the largest driverless metro uh, network, uh, which is uh, under co uh, construction and commissioning. So uh, in the in the in the next few years. The Riyadh Metro network will be six lines uh, of about 170 kilometers of double track. So this is a real massive, massive asset portfolio that will be transferred to the uh, Riyadh Transport Authority, the Riyadh Development Authority. And um, as you can imagine, even if, if for a new contract or for a new metro, uh, asset management is not uh, always the most challenging issue. With such a huge portfolio, it has to be taken into account from the first steps uh, because it will be uh, very complicated to, to manage such, such, uh, such a big uh, asset portfolio. We are talking about more than 90 self stations with uh, three major iconic stations, with, which are huge building with uh, amenities and ancillary services, uh, almost uh, shops uh, or um, uh, mall. Sorry. Uh, so these are very, very big buildings. 12 parks and ride facilities uh, and a uh, rolling stock fleet of, of almost uh, two, 200, uh, 200 trades. Uh, trains, seven depots and five uh, operation control centers. So as you can see, this is a very, very huge project and there is a big, big challenge to uh, be able to manage these assets in the uh, in the in the in the coming years. Uh, so here again, as we're talking about asset management, so we first work with the Riyadh Transport Authority about uh, defining the strategic uh, objective of the operation and maintenance contract. Uh, so, uh, which are quite uh, common now in the rail sector, but it's always good to to write uh, to write it uh, quite uh, clearly. So, the Area Development Authority was uh, requiring a safe and secure, rap rapid and reliable, and also comfortable, demand responsive, 
seamless door-to-door -door transportation service to all Riyadh dwellers. And it is, I think, uh, a big transformation in the Riyadh so, uh, society because uh, today there is very, there are very few uh, public transportation services, and uh, so it's important to to provide this type uh, this type of objectives to uh, to provide to the to the population uh, uh, a good transport services that could, in my opinion, change uh, their life uh, very quickly if they can uh, move easier in the city. And so it derived in in three strategic uh, objective streams: provide a transport service to users, manage the asset provided by the asset owner. This is uh, where we will focus on, and contribute to a positive and attractive image of the city as a major public service provider. Obviously, as we all know, uh, such a transportation system is a way to uh, have. Uh, new visibility on the international um, stage for a city like uh, Riyadh. And in that way, uh, if we have, uh, if we, once we consider that the image is very, very important, we have to enter that as an objective within the asset management uh, decisions uh, support process. And of course, we have to implement a robust asset management strategy and processes because uh, if we are, want this image to be maintained within the long term, we have to manage the asset adequately so they remain in a, uh, in a, um, an adequate condition at the long term. For that, even if um, we have uh, uh, the budget to pay the operation, the operators and maintainers. It's important to to to, say, to tell them, okay, what I am expecting from you uh, within uh, as um, maintaining the condition of my asset is that level of service, that level of expectation, and we have to define it very clearly because, on the contrary, it is very hard for the other stakeholders to understand what they are required for. It is easy, easy to ask them to follow the maintenance plan, but then when the maintenance plan are not enough to maintain the asset in a good conditions, uh, we have to ask them to, um, uh, to inform us, to inform the transport authorities so the good decision can be taken and in any way the asset will not be in a wrong condition at the mid-term or long-term. So that means that this is an overview of the content of the maintenance and asset management uh, requirement of the contract. And uh, I think that most important and the point that I want would like you to um, remind after this uh, this quick presentation is that all 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 requirement cannot be mixed. It's very important to uh, make the distinction between what is the, the performance requirement that, of course, will lead to uh, the level of maintenance required. But then what are the maintenance core activities, the, the maintenance responsibilities that we expect from the maintainer? But on the other hand, what are the asset management requirements that, that we expect? Because maintenance and asset management are closely linked, but are not exact, exactly the same thing. And where maintenance is looking on day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance issues, asset management is looking for uh, mid-term and long-term. So these are different responsibilities. We are expecting different competencies from our maintainer, and we have to tell him, tell him it to him very clearly if we want him to uh, have these competencies. And then, of course, and it will be a great link with uh, what uh, Martin will present on the fourth uh, on the fourth case studies, uh, asset information, knowledge management, and data and data digital asset management requirements are also a quite important part. So um, first, I think that best way to make sure that the maintainer aligns uh, his activities with the strategic objectives is to uh, go on a performance-based contract and define uh, transit system maintenance performance indicators, KPIs, key performance indicators, and facilities maintenance performance indicators that are aligned with the uh, asset management, uh, uh, with the um, auto transport authority asset management objectives. I come back to what I told quickly before. We are talking about alignment, the transport authority defining its objectives, 
then I have to derivate these objectives in KPI for my, my uh, maintenance entity uh, that makes sense uh, and are more technicals, but are still aligned, uh, but are aligned with my strategic objectives. So the maintenance performance will be measured through dedicated KPIs, which I could uh, demonstrate to the stakeholders and shareholders that are aligned with um, my strategic objectives the, that I defined for the, this transport system. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have the core maintenance activities. Um, usually the design and build contracts will provide maintenance documentations and it will be an input for the maintenance activities. So uh, the maintenance strategy of my ma of my maintainers, um, we set um, requirement to define an overall framework for maintenance definition, delivery and continuous improvement. We made requirements about how do we expect the, our maintainer to uh, plan the maintenance, to plan the emergency works that we are not able to um, to, to to identify early, but that will uh, happen. How will they manage the spare parts? And then the, the core maintenance activities, uh, which will be the inspection, the preventive maintenance, the corrective maintenance, and the, all which is about lifespan and residual life uh, preservations. They will have to record the, uh, what they do because this is a knowledge which is important for the authority. And they will uh, report on maintenance services and the uh, lifespan and asset condition. Then, in addition, we have here the asset management requirements. So we used um, as a framework uh, the, Indian, in the international best practice compliance through the ISO 55000 uh, third party certification which is required for the maintainer. David, just after this uh, case study, will explain you more uh, about the ISO 55000. And uh, so we asked them to establish a strategic asset management plan. So uh, how will the maintainer guarantee that the asset condition allow de delivering world-class services and preserving the asset optimal lifespan? Uh, they will provide, we require them to uh, provide asset management assistance to the area development authority. It means remind them that, okay, maintenance is your business, but we also ask you to help me to manage my assets. So I will need information and uh, assistance from you, my maintainer, to uh, better plan what will be uh, the, the investment that I will have to face in the coming years, even after the end of the contractual agreement. We, through that, we are asking the maintainer to provide his um, expertise on what should be done during his contract, but also in the three, four, five years after his contract, because it will be a very important input for uh, the transport authority to, de to define what will be expected in the next contract. Then, as I told, the asset management system should be certified against uh, ISO 55001. Why? Because it will help the uh, Area Development Authority to have third-party um, uh, advice about do my maintainer manage my asset well. We have, of course, reporting and then uh, everything which is about the feedback and the continuous, in, uh, continuous improvement. And then to make that uh, live within the time, we have to think about asset information and uh, knowledge management with a computerized maintenance management system, which is quite classical and for day-to-day -day maintenance. But uh, the authority, um, uh, the authority uh, plan to implement an overarching asset management solution, an asset management system to help them to make informed and good decision. And uh, we define all the requirements to how the maintainer should interface with this solution. And independently of that, an asset monitoring database, which is like the asset register that we talked before, but adding all which is about the condition of the assets within the time, and which is the way that the area transport authority he will be able to develop knowledge about how my, do my um, assets are living and how do they um, how do they degrade and when should I um, act to renew them? 
few lesson learned about this uh, this case studies. Uh, so ISO 55000 is clearly a recognized uh, international and scalable set of practices, and it's, it is very useful to establish asset management uh, processes because now it is more and more known within the industry. And uh, and uh, so it helps uh, all stakeholders, all companies that are working within an asset portfolio to better understand themselves. It's a valuable framework to define the asset management practices for greenfield projects. Also, we all, we always think about that for brownfield project, but it's important for greenfield project. Yeah, it has to be completed, of course, with the experience and the expertise of the engineering uh, companies and maintainers to to make it uh, tailored for the project. With that, it is very important to uh, clearly define the rule of gains for all the players, and this is what I insisted on: have clear requirements. Uh, and do not think that I do not speak about asset management because my maintenance has to do that. No, this is not his primary work. And if we expect him to go further in asset management, we have to tell him so he's able to uh, to to dedicate a budget and competencies to that. And finally, the certification, I think, uh, provides the long term insurance to the owner that the processes are in place. And if he changes the maintainer, he will be able to follow uh, and to go on with these uh, processes. And uh, with that, I share what I wanted to, yeah. to share with you. Thank you, Jerome. And I think this this leads on from the last conversation quite well. I think the the, the idea that um, your maintenance management uh, uh, framework has to align directly with your uh, objectives or your strategic objectives. It, it's clearly defined here by the Riyadh Metro where they want a safe, secure, rapid, rapid and reliable and comfortable uh, demand responsive. But the challenge with that that sits in there is that, you know, these are normally defined by, you know, uh, the higher ups. Um, a maintainer or somebody who's sitting here on the call is going, well, how do I take a word such as safe or secure or reliable, then distill it down uh, to where down it clearly means something to my maintenance plan? Um, any thoughts on that? Because, you know, there, there is always a need to have a straight line to a simple word as reliable. What would, how would you then define something like that? Uh, so th this is like, um... This, this is a like a systematic process about um, regarding the assets. How do they contribute uh, to my objectives? For example, the reliability and so on. And then to uh, focus on the critical assets and say, okay. Uh, for example, I come back to the the the, the power substation. Uh, this is clearly a critical asset. If it fails, it could uh, cause a delay, and uh, I have to ensure that both my maintenance, my asset condition process, and all the monitoring is uh, at a top level because because it is a critical asset. On the other hand, maybe that some of the assets that I have uh, could have less impact on my objectives. Um, like, for example, access control in some cases or some um, some um, uh, some uh, equipment within the stations, even if all are important, maybe they are not so critical than uh, the, the the asset that that contribute to the train movement regarding my objectives. And I have to adapt the asset management policy uh, to uh, to that. This is an important process, but and it is, I think, very important to keep in mind. Necessarily, uh, a simply um, a process that will simplify very complex things. So, it has advantages, but it also have um, uh, create some issues. But the important things is that we have this clearly defined, and we can share it between the stakeholders. Of course. In some cases, we will say, okay, or asset management uh, process or this, this alignment, we consider that this is most important, but today uh, we can see on the field that this is not the case. Okay, we'll update that. But at least we have a tool that we can update and that lead to continuous improvement and communication between the people, which I think is uh, the way that 
we are beginning to make the people think about this alignment. OK, I do that action because it is aligned with that objective. Thank you, Jerome. And, and, and do we have any questions from the floor? I haven't looked in the chat. Uh, if anybody has, what do they call it, uh, has brought up any questions. But while we're waiting for people to bring up the, the questions without uh, uh, spoiling the, the, what do they call it, uh, uh, David Sander or, 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 or stealing David Sander, you, you speak about the scalability of, of ISO 55001. And, and, and to me, that's an important discussion because a lot of people, I mean, having gone through this, um, over the last five years and, and implementing and, and, and moving our processes towards that. Um, it, 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 it's always challenging to start, but a lot yeah. of people tend to think that you must start big. Uh, give your thoughts about the scalability, uh, obviously without stealing the thunder from David's uh, 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 presentation. Any thoughts on, on, on the issue of starting small and then implementing the basics and then building up from there? Uh, okay, I, I'll try not to steal David uh, <laughs> David information, and uh, I'm sure he could uh, complete what I, I will say. But yeah, in my opinion, and this is something that we already discussed, I think uh, several times we, with David, and we are totally aligned on that. Uh, you you have to uh, you have to start in a part of your organization, which could be a part of the asset portfolio or a part of the asset management activities, or both combined, and then you are going to um, to define, uh, to, to implement the standard and the process on this part. And once you are comfortable with that, I think it will be time to expand. What is the issue? What is important is that you have to select well the scope of on which you will begin. Because if you select a scope that is too small and that will not allow you to have the benefits from the standards, then your board or your stakeholders or shareholders we we'll do not understand why you're doing, doing that, but it's important to start with what is maybe more critical or what could be bring more value to uh, my organization regarding its contractual uh, uh, commitments and then to, to expand. That is what I would recommend because as all ISO standards, if you start too big, there is a lot of things that are not written in the standards, but then you will face that it's very uh, Import, it's very difficult for the people because we are talking about changing the mindsets about things that have been already done. And this is a change management within the organization. And if you don't do that, you will not succeed. And doing change management on too much topics within an organization is quite uh, not possible. I think it's, uh, it's, too, it's a too big challenge. Jerome, me and you can over carry on about this for a very long time because this yes. is a subject that I really enjoy. But um, I think uh, all that is left for me is to thank you and thank you for what do they call it for your time. Uh, Jerome is here. And as we continue with the conversation, if you put any of your questions in the chat box, we will continue with the conversation. And uh, and, and, and and thank you, Jerome. Um, my thank next speaker. Much. Thank you, sir. Uh, my, my next speaker is David Simpson. And David Simpson uh, holds an executive MBA from the Imperial College uh, of, uh, of Business uh, in the UK. And he is certified as a project manager. Uh, he has an extensive experience in PPPs across Europe, Africa, South America, and Australia, and has spearheaded best practices in asset management in various projects. Um, and he, is, he has successfully led an ISO um, 55001 accreditation process for uh, some of his projects. And he's currently leading the implementation and the integration of asset uh, management IT software. Uh, he's a man who comes uh, as we say, with the order they call it, with a CV that reads like uh, the specification for one of my expensive BMWs. Uh, okay. Welcome, David. Uh, David will be speaking to us about uh, ISO 55001 certification of the Douglas uh, uh, Light uh, Railway in London uh, in the UK. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Can you all um, hear me and uh, see me OK? Yes, we can see you. Brilliant. Indeed, Great. Indeed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I've got just around ten minutes to give you a quick whirlwind tour of um, ISO fifty five thousand and one, the the standard, uh, making that relevant through a uh, for a case study and then some conclusions to wrap up at the end. So it'll be a, quite a quick 
well in tour, but happy to, to stay back for uh, questions at the um, at the end. Um, so, so Jerome's really done a really good introduction on, on some of the themes I'm going to talk about here in terms of ISO 55001. Just in terms of some basic kind of concepts and, and, and terminology, um, the ISO 55000 series, which is the International Standard for Asset Management, was published back in 2014. Like many of the ISOs, there's a initial section, uh, ISO 55000, which talks about kind of concepts and, and terminology. It's 55001, which talks about the framework you need to put in place um, to align with the, the standard. And then 55002 um, talks about interpretation and implementation of the, um, of the standard. So really in this presentation, I'm going to talk about 55001, which are, are the requirements really for, for putting in place um, a robust asset management framework in your, in your organization. And I guess framework's a really important word um, because it's not a, a specification. Um, what it does is it highlights the key building blocks you need to put in place to have an effective asset management approach. It talks about outputs um, that you need to achieve, but it won't tell you how to do it. Um, that really needs to be kind of scoped and done um, to an appropriate level, subject to your organization, its objectives, its size, etc. And I can maybe come back on on scope and uh, scale towards the end to pick up on some of the comments that um, that uh, Jerome made just a few minutes ago. In terms of some of the building blocks, so so on the screen here, you've got the key kind of clauses um, in the ISO 55001 um, requirements. A lot of this is, is probably common stuff, you would think. So things like planning, managing risk and opportunity. Jerome talked about achieving asset management objectives earlier. There's some very operational things as well. So planning and control, how you deliver your asset management plan. I think the interesting thing for me is there's a whole load of activities over here on the left, which are which are softer. So it's around kind of awareness, uh, communication, leadership, which I think often people underestimate in terms of the the um, effort required to put those aspects into into place and maintain them. And uh, Jerome talked earlier about culture and the importance of having a kind of an effective asset management culture in place as well. So the key key message here is it's a mix of some quite, you know, quite, quite sort of technical engineering aspects, but the softer aspects are in there as well and are key to a successful um, implementation. Um, and overseeing all of that is the context of the of the organization. Um, so really as a as a foundation, understanding your organization's objectives, what they're trying to achieve, cascading that into asset management objectives and asset management policy, and having that really as a cornerstone of how you then implement your management system to deliver those, those outcomes. Okay, so they're the key, the key building blocks there. In terms of Aegis and the, the standard, so, so we started addressing uh, the ISO 55001 standard really from the eyes of an asset manager. So as Aegis, we, we manage around 40 different um, highways contracts around the world, 17 airports. Um, so as sort of asset managers ourselves, on certain projects we wanted to demonstrate to third parties, to stakeholders that we were effective asset managers, had the right systems processes in place, so we basically off our own backs went and, and got certification um, and in a couple of cases particularly in anglo-saxon countries now we're seen as a contract requirement um, to to put iso 55001 compliance systems in 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 place um, so we've been kind of obliged to do it through the mobilization of certain certain contracts for example this contract here in the top left corner in 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 dublin the Dublin Port Tunnel was one where within the first two years we had to put in place a system a set of processes compliant with ISO 55001. Conversely over here on the right, Portugal in the United Kingdom, the M25 motorway network uh, were projects where as Aegis we wanted to put in place a robust asset management approach to, to demonstrate a, a certain level of, of, of competency. And what we've done then as Aegis is based on our own experiences implementing 
ISO 55, 55001 for our own projects. So we then exported that and we have supported other third parties in implementing the, uh, the standard, uh, which leads me nicely on to the Docklands Light Railway um, and a project we, we delivered with our partners, Keolis, um, to successfully uh, achieve ISO 55001 certification um, for this key part of the Overground London network. So I'll drill down into a bit more in terms of that specific case study now. Um, not sure how many of you are familiar with the um, the transport network around London. Um, the specific part we dealt with, the Docklands Light Railway, is towards the east of the uh, of the city and serves Canary Wharf, which is a key kind of financial hub um, within within London. Um, the project itself, uh, it's automated light metro system. Um, in terms of the staff footprint, it's about a thousand staff in, 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 in total over two sites with about a third of the workforce with a very strong asset management focus. And coming back to what I said before, um, effectively the requirement to achieve ISO 55001 was a contractual promise, if you like. Um, and when we got involved, the uh, franchisee was under pressure to actually make good on that uh, on that promise and to do so quite uh, quite quickly. So just in terms of additional context around the project, we had Transport for London as the overarching transport authority within within London and who are themselves very mature around asset management topics. There was a sort of a concession type model where you had uh, Docklands Light Railway Limited, DLRL, sitting in the, the middle, and then the Keolis Amy Docklands uh, joint venture, which was basically delivering the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance uh, services. And effectively, Keolis and, and Aegis, we, we teamed up. Um, as Aegis, we um, implanted a project manager within the CAD teams to provide sort of day-to-day -day guidance and support. And we connected that project manager up with a group of, sort of back office international asset management experts who provided guidance to that project manager uh, and provided support in doing the various quality checks and um, gateway reviews along the certification process. What did that process look like? Um, so I've tried to summarise it here in around seven steps. Initially, a, a first step, quite classic, was understanding the existing management system. Um, it's fair to say that uh, Curious Amy Docklands believed they had a, a relatively mature asset management approach in, in, in place. Um, even still, we, we, we found um, areas re requiring quite significant improvement through our initial gap analysis. Um, we developed with them a, a sort of detailed improvement plan across 10 clauses of ISO 55001. We embedded that project manager with them to provide day-to-day -day guidance and support. Um, coming back to those sort of softer topics I talked about earlier, we actually had to in almost create um, or inject the project with more um, activity around awareness, communication and, and management review because at the time, the project maybe had focused more on the harder aspects of, of asset management and less so on making people aware of, of the asset management system, why it was important, their place and their role in the effective asset management uh, system approach. So, so quite a lot of focus on, on some specific activities and events around those key topics there. And then we you know, went through a seri series of internal reviews and gateways to prep the team, make sure the uh, improvement plans had been implemented and, and evidenced. So went through a series of reviews and then we were ready for the certification process, which was a stage one, which was more focused on the sort of the, the documentation side, planning for success, if you like. And then the stage two, which was more, well, evidencing and demonstrating that that documentation was robustly in place and being, being kind of used on a day-to-day -day basis. I suppose the important message as well is to say that after the, the, the stage two, that's not the end. Like all good ISO uh, standards, the idea is you move into a cycle of continuous improvement. So the system is forever 
evolving and and improving and then you move into a cycle of um, surveillance visits as well so you do have renewal audits every every three years um, after that successful stage two uh, audit so in, in terms of looking at uh, CAD as a case study, which which areas required the um, the most work? And actually, there's parallels with some of the other projects I've been in, involved with here too. Um, quite a bit of work in terms of that line of sight between the organisation's sort of business plan and then the objectives in terms of asset management and setting up that framework which Jerome talked about earlier in terms of the strategic asset management plan, which is kind of like the, the, the kind of the keystone that underpins the asset management approach in the in the organization. So the, the strategic asset management plan, a key key aspect that required required development. It didn't exist before. Um, quite a lot of focus in terms of integrating processes across the organization. Um, the organization was a little bit siloed in terms of the different teams all having their own um, processes. As we all know, asset management is a, is a cycle, so it requires teams to collaborate, coordinate across the life cycle. And, and a lot of the processes we, we looked at weren't that well integrated across the different teams. So it's so quite a lot of work there. Uh, and, and a focus on risk and opportunity, more the opportunity aspect. The risk management process was was fairly robust, but they didn't approach things with an opportunity mindset and an opportunity lens as well. In terms of planning, trying to extend the horizons from a very annualized approach to a more five year type approach. Uh, in terms of operations, um, looking at how the asset management objectives and requirements cascaded through into the supply chain through the the procurement process and how suppliers were measured against the the asset management outcomes that the um, organization was seeking and as i've mentioned some of the more kind of human aspects in terms of awareness communication leadership required some some specific uh, activity as, as as well and then finally in terms of performance evaluation they had a really robust performance evaluation approach in place but not really a clear line of sight in terms of the asset specific performance and how that was linking back to the asset management objectives so that they could understand if they were successfully delivering on those objectives or were, were falling short. What were the benefits to all of this? Well, I've touched on on some of this a little bit already. Um, in some cases, we see ISO 55001 as a as a requirement, so it's, it's about contract um, compliance or making good on 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 tender promises. Um, and we're we're kind of seeing that definitely in in, in Anglo-Saxon um, countries and and the Middle East in terms of that kind of contractual aspect. It's a really good quality stamp as well to clients, stakeholders and, and other um, investors to demonstrate that there's a robust asset management um, approach in place. It can be important from a, from a reputation point of view. Um, you can be seen as a pioneer in the in the local market in terms of asset management good practice. And obviously, very importantly, there's business benefits in terms of having an effective asset management system in, in place. And I'll kind of drill down a little bit now into some of those business benefits. So, so, so clearly, by improving the process approach, by aligning the processes with the asset management outcomes and objectives clearly it's going to improve all round decision making and improve decision making across different organizational teams uh, from a business improvement perspective it should ultimately increase and improve asset performance so reduce uh, breakdowns outages and improve therefore uh, budget performance um, and from a competency point of view the program I talked about in terms of increasing awareness, communication, leadership, upskilling. Ultimately, what you're doing is you're providing a competence upgrade to your whole workforce, which then will result in improved operational um, performance. So I'm conscious of, of, of time, a bit of a quick whirlwind tour, as I, I mentioned, just a few kind of takeaways. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, 
ISO 55001. It's, it's a framework, it's not a specification, but it's a really good framework to, to use to understand how you can improve your asset management system and, and processes. Jerome mentioned scoping. Um, so you can definitely start small and get an initial certification scope under your belt and then grow that. And you can even grow the approach as part of that three year um, review cycle. And I've seen projects do that, but I definitely agree with the approach of not scoping it so big and so large that you end up in a two, three year change project and people you lose sort of interest, lose dynamism. Um, I, I, I think you need to kind of be sensible about what kind of scope you start with initially. In terms of time to deliver, um, I've seen projects delivered in, 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 in 12 months, but I would suggest that's the, the minimum. Um, and as I just said, you know, as a maximum, you probably don't want to be going beyond sort of two years or three years because you kind of lose that um, organisational kind of buy in and, and dynamism, I would suggest. Um, as I've mentioned, the standard addresses very structural operational topics, but very soft issues as, as, as well, which I've mentioned throughout the presentation in terms of leadership, communication and, and awareness, which really are fundamental actually to making sure the system takes um, and is sort of understood and implemented effectively by, by the, the workforce. So don't underplay the importance of those, those aspects. Um, as I've mentioned, you know, I've, I've seen uh, performance improvement as a result of implementing the, the approach on projects where Aegis is the asset manager. And I've seen it on, on third party projects where we've supported asset managers um, achieve the standard as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of persuaded as to the, the, the benefits and the relevance of the, of the standard. And I think externally it, it's seen as a very positive step by, by stakeholders, whether that be clients, investors, other members of the industry, because it demonstrates that you're an asset management organization, which is prioritizing asset management and the benefits that, that come with it. Okay, that's it. That's all the all the presentation. Um, hopefully that was clear, but um, I can I can stick around for any any questions. Thank you, David. You did great justice in what do they call it in the shortest time possible. Um, and this is a very, you know, extended. Uh, uh, um, but I love it when what do they call it when project managers talk about their battle scars. Uh, I, I hear that the communication issue did hit you quite a bit. Um, but let's talk about change management fatigue, you know, uh, with what do they call it, or, 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 and the issue of scoping too large. You know, if we were to combine the scoping and what you're talking about, what we call the change fatigue. Uh, but generally, the, the softer issues in ISO 55001, um, and, 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 and maybe the experience that you, you know, the direct experience from this project that you bring on, and what would have happened, and, you know, how did you resolve some of the problems? Or maybe what were the key lessons learned out of that? Yeah, I think, I think I mean, fun, fundamentally, we've got to kind of take a step back and realise that all of these management systems, it's, it's people delivering them at the end of the day. So if you focus too much on the on the process and you neglect the people, or well, the processes aren't gonna gonna work, they're not gonna stick, they're not gonna be gonna be effective. And I've noticed in a lot of the projects I've been involved with that there's a real hunger from the people on the projects to understand more about asset management. At times it's a it's 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 sort of jargon or people don't really understand what it is because they don't understand what it is, they don't understand how they can um, support successful asset management outcomes. So I would say that getting the people on side, um, giving them access to even basic kind of training around asset management and what it means and, and how they can have a pos positive impact. Doing that, you know, very quickly aligns the organization with what you're trying to achieve and gets the workforce on side. Um, and, you know, you get kind of a whole load of supporters in the in the project whereas if you try and address it just from a from a technical standpoint and through process the risk is that the processes won't won't take and won't won't hold um because the people don't understand the benefits or why all the processes are being are being changed and um and updated and i think that's a really positive outcome that i've witnessed on a number of projects which is when you invest in the awareness the communication the leadership it, it, you know the organization very quickly then becomes the driving force of the project, whereas when you don't, it becomes more of an uphill um, struggle. 
You're leading on to my next question overall while I'm waiting to see if there's any questions in order to in, in, in the chat box overall uh, that relate to this. I can I can hear it, you know, there's there's what there's mumbling out there is that well, how do I convince the CEO? How do I convince the CEO? Um leadership commitment, as it's stated in every ISO standard, uh, is an important issue, but it's normally the one piece that that is challenging. I, I like the way you've approached it and you said, well, this is an opportunity to educate everybody in the business about asset management. Can you give some thoughts on on, on that and, and how you know what the experience has been on 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 on, on Doc? Yeah, I think I think the really good thing from from the Docklands perspective is it was driven from the the top, from the management team. But at the same time, they were quite humble in saying, "Look, we we don't know everything about asset management. We think we've got a good foundation in place." Um, but you know, as as part of the process, even the management team, you know, did did some sort of away days and um, did some training themselves to really understand what it all meant how it worked and even their roles in terms of making sure the the system worked and fulfilled its potential so i think you do need obviously senior leadership and leadership kind of buy-in it doesn't mean those people need to be experts them, themselves you know they can they can kind of learn and improve their competencies as part of the process and part of the the journey um i just think as long as those people are receptive to the change see the the benefits which which fundamentally are quite quite simple um then 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 i think that's going to be a successful recipe for the um the program of change Thank you, David, and thank you for what they call it for uh, for the conversation. I think this has been a riveting experience, and um, I think everybody can learn a lot uh, from you guys as as EGs. Um, and we, as we continue on with our program, uh, thank you, David, and and we move on to uh, Martin uh, Valance. And Martin will what do they call it? Um, will then be talking to us about something that is interesting me because I uh, as you lead out of ISO 55,000 if you as you saw from Jerome the last bit of it is about data uh, and data and more data and if you don't have data you don't know what you're managing and um, and that is the conversation we're going to have now. Martin is a leading digital asset uh, um, manager. Uh, Martin has one of those jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago a digital asset management uh, uh, manager uh, the function with edges solutions uh, and industry leader who has won uh, you know recognition amongst his peers uh, through the uh, development and implementation of pioneering projects uh, through our what um, you know winning innovations all around in aviation uh, in rail business uh, and in digital excellence category man the man has been awarded uh, like a proper you know prized bull uh, at a farm uh, thank you sir uh, take us through uh, what do they call it uh, your the, the the program today thank you very much um that that is a uh, that's probably the best introduction and analogy i've ever had being uh, referred to as a prize bull i'll take that i like it thank you very much uh, I have the unenviable um, position of presenting last today, so I must make up for time and I should do my best to do so. Um, hi, Martin Valance. Um, I am based here in the UK, just outside of London, and uh, today I'll be talking a little bit about digital asset management um, and also within the context of Network Rao, how they've implemented a large scale um, digitisation programme across the entire UK network. The UK round network is circa 20,000 miles. It incorporates 30,000 bridges, tunnels and viaducts and uh, has around 200, uh, sorry, 2,500 stations um, across the, the, the network in uh, Wales, England and Scotland. Um, it's a fairly substantial and, and fairly busy railway network. So what do we mean by uh, digital asset management? So uh, Digital asset management focuses, um, and this is very much my interpretation, on three main uh, components. The first is, uh, is, is the what. What are the assets that we're looking at? So that can be the asset type. So it might be switch gear, it might be overhead line, it might be the physical track itself. What is the asset model? So we understand um, 
uh, what type of equipment it is and also what model of equipment it is, what's its composition, um, uh, how's it set up, how's it structured and its material. Uh, so that's the first element is understanding the what. Uh, the second element, uh, really easy, is understanding the where. So organisationally aligned spatial reference. What do we mean by that? We mean that making sure that there is a common reference model upon which all assets are um, located uh, spatially on a map. This is uh, often difficult because different asset types and different engineering departments might have different spatial um, systems and processes in place so the track might use um, a, a kilometrage whereas the overhead line might use a, um, a, a GPS coordinate and X and Y coordinates so um, making sure that they're spatially aligned is very important because then you can represent everything on a uh, on a map together and then the final element is condition so understanding um, what what condition that asset is in at any given time uh, that can take form of a visual or a tactile inspection tactile being touchable uh, visual obviously just examining it externally um, there might be remote condition monitoring you might have sensors um, associated to that equipment there might be SCADA systems in place uh, and then finally we have dynamic data and dynamic data being that data that is collected usually from uh, vehicle mounted uh, can also be drone um, in some instances but making sure we're getting things such as track geometry reading or if we're talking about overhead line then there are heights and staggers measurements of the overhead line once we have all of that information, the what, the where and the condition, we're able to then do some of the, some of the uh, intelligent asset management analytics, uh, which is where digital asset management really comes into its own. So the wraparound um, of all of that is, of course, technology. That's where the digital element comes into it. And that tele technology might be using um, new forms of data capture, such as uh, drone um, aerial imagery. Um, there's obviously cloud computing, um, uh, AI, machine learning. Um, there's a whole different host of, of elements which form asset management. And it doesn't have to be really complicated, and it certainly doesn't have to be really expensive. Data analytics now is not an expensive foray for most organizations it's, it's, it's fairly standard. So the process that we follow here um, uh, in Aegis when we're helping clients to undertake this um, uh, this this move towards a, a digital asset management. First step is uh, of course capturing the data so we just spoke about that understanding the what the where and the condition uh, and there's a number of different ways that data can be captured of course we've said there's remote condition monitoring or SCADA systems uh, aerial or drone surveys, maintenance engineers, so uh, people physically on the ground collecting data, uh, and then finally dynamic data. In, in the UK, we have yellow measurement trains which run around the network and collect a number of different uh, data points on a daily basis. Once that data has been collected, is of course important to then store it. And, and actually the structuring of that storage uh, is often where organisations face some challenges, not only in physical size of the data, most of it with the exception perhaps of the aerial um, sort of imagery data is, is fairly small in, in terms of size. But how you structure that data so that it can be um, coordinated together to create a holistic picture of the network. Uh, asset owners are often really good at siloing their data. Bringing that data together into a common data environment is, is often a different task, and that's something that we support um, our clients with very heavily here. Once you do have that data in a common data environment, spatially aligned so that everything can be referenced uh, in, in a singular way, then we're able to apply some of those analytics. We're able to do those uh, decision support tools, those dashboards that really help um, uh, the end users to make the, the decision. Ultimately, this is about the transfer from data into, into knowledge or actionable insights for operators to be able to make a decision on their network. This would also be where digital twin could come into play if that's an element that the uh, organization is interested in looking at. Um, digital twin for me is the, the next evolution of asset management and is about bringing not only all that data together and visualizing it, but allowing those decisions to be made in real time and in the real world environment. The different dashboards can be created dependent upon the requirements of the users. So asset managers might want to look at that long term strategic view of investment of assets over the next five, 10 or 15 years. Whereas the maintenance teams are more likely to be interested in the here and now, maybe the next 12 months so that they can make decisions to help the, the, the running of the railway. 
And then operational teams might be interested from a perspective of timetable scheduling, perhaps. Um, uh, and so their spin on how the data is viewed is slightly different, but again, still using those data sets that's available to them. And that final stage, we call it exploitation, but this is the use. This is where the physical users can actually um, get hold of the data, they can visualize it, they can maybe manipulate it, and they can make those decisions. What's really important is about making all of these um, attributes fully scalable so that they can work for small sections of network or entire national networks with all different asset types. Then we come back into the design phase. Now, this is really important and, and in the context of some of the presentations that we've had here and some of the questions has been around the um, how can we support with some of the vandalism um, uh, and damage issues that's faced uh, on the network here. This is where I would look to take some of that data that we've captured, we've stored, we've started to analyze it, and we can start to understand where are the real pain points, what is the type of asset that is particularly prone to vandalism, and how can we help to design out that ability to uh, make it uh, vandal proof. Um, often easier said than done, no doubt, um, but it is certainly an element here where we would look to take that loop, uh, those failure modes back into design, and to make sure that we are designing them out in the future. Best practice. So where have we put that in, in, into um, practice? Well, one of the uh, case studies that we're going to talk about is the Intelligent Infrastructure Program. So the Intelligent Infrastructure Program is a uh, network rail wide, five year, uh, around 190 million pound digital transformation program. Um, uh, and their aim here was to help um, predict and prevent uh, maintenance. So it was very much a maintenance focused program, taking all the data that's available and turning that into intelligent, actionable insights. So for Network Row, it meant that there was uh, an intelligent view of data. It was uh, a network wide connected view. So looking at all the different asset types and it very much had a future focus. How do we move Network Row into the next future um, sort of innovation of uh, both technology maintenance and asset management? For the maintenance teams in Network Rails, it helped to create and is helping to create a safer work, uh, working environment. Removing boots from ballast is a phrase that we'll hear a lot in the UK here. Uh, and effectively, if you don't have to send a team of people um, to investigate a fault because you can do that remotely, you are making a safer environment. Uh, it's smarter working. We're sending um, engineers to the right place at the right time with the right materials and tools to fix the failure um, rather than letting people uh, go out and uh, investigate on site, perhaps have to then go back to the depot, collect the right tools, come back, correct it, find out they were working on the wrong section of track. This happens very often. And then finally, it was that seamless working. So it was about giving access uh, to, the, to the frontline users, to the data that they need to ensure they can do a better job on the front line. For the railway passengers of the UK, it meant they could get home safe because we were predicting and fixing asset failures before they happen. Um, we could get home, um, uh, uh, get the customers home on time, creating a more reliable service, uh, and of course, creating a happy, uh, better passenger journey, all of which is really important if we want to continue that push towards greater use of the railways, movement off of the roads. Um, and, and of course, that's been a real challenge since the uh, COVID pandemic. So, Quickly, some of the uh, projects that have been initiated, as I said, it's a 190 million pound five year program. There was a number of different discrete projects that have been developed across a number of asset groups. So you'll see in the columns there, we have different asset types such as track, signaling, electrification and plant planning and civils. And then we have a number of products that have been developed here. Some of these are very bespoke and customized. Some of them are off the shelf products that have been adopted by Network Route. These have been grouped into different types of delivery. So uh, insight and streams are, have been referenced as DSTs. DSTs are decision support tools. So this is taking the data that's available to help make those decisions uh, in the future by the frontline staff. We have inspection tools, so better line side inspection capabilities. Planning tools to help us make sure that we're scheduling the right type of activities with the right teams at the right time. Um, Citadel is the new enterprise asset management system for operational property in, in uh, the UK. So that's all your stations uh, and depot assets. And then finally, there is work management. So to make sure that we are creating the work, um, uh, issuing the work and then capturing the closeout of those works better um, uh, via a, a suite of tools that are being issued there. 
What's been really important in Network Hour is how they've used the frontline teams to help inform this programme. You are always at risk uh, of something of this scale and of this length of almost alienating the end users because you you, you become a programme, you deliver what you need to deliver, and you sort of land it on users and you walk away. And uh, as my colleague David explained, these types of change programmes, it's really important that you bring people on that journey with you. So frontline colleagues have helped us to prioritise in a very agile um, project delivery way to help prioritise which functionality is developed and when so that we can deliver it at the right time. Some of this is seasonal. Some of these tools work better, for example, in geotechs. They're seasonal tools. They need to have access to them um, in the autumn because they're very useful for when their winter hits, which can have a huge impact on the UK rail network. We've also made sure that the functionality has been tested um, with our users. So we've really brought them on that journey with us. They've helped to tell us when they would like that capability delivered and, and how it's developed. We've then brought them on the testing journey with us. So they've been involved from the very start. They've had ownership of the capability, uh, which is really important because, of course, we are a, a temporary program that will disappear after a period of time. And it is the end users who need to continue using these tools for the for the coming years. And then finally, we're making user driven decisions. Uh, you know, how, what, when and where we develop capability and deliver it has been driven by the users. It's been very much, it's their tools. It won't benefit. Um, it's, it's not a central program. It is a end user driven program. So we've made sure that they will get the real benefits from using those tools that, that they need to achieve. So we've created, uh, uh, created a suite of user driven tools, and, and this is just one example here of, of a user driven tool, which is uh, an analytics uh, decision support tool for uh, overhead line for EMP capability here in the UK. It's very simple. It's not about creating really complex tools. It's about giving access to data that is already collected, but it's sometimes difficult to either get your hands on or to aggregate or to analyze. And, and we do all of that together in our, in our tools. So final slide here, what was Aegis's role or uh, is Aegis's role, should I say, on the Intelligent Infrastructure Programme? It runs until April 2024. So we're, we're coming into around the last year and a bit of delivery now. Um, so there's a lot of focus on getting the capabilities uh, tested and, and trialled and out with our end users. So we've had a number of different teams in there. We've, we've provided um, a, a lot of people in the communications, the commercial and the planning side. We've currently got six people live on that. Uh, we have three program managers, three project managers and three junior project managers working on the program. Uh, we've got three data analysts and architects currently live. That number fluctuates uh, very early on in, in the proof of concept development. We was more around the six or seven mark of the data analysts. But as we've gone into that build and test phase, the data analysts have, have scaled back. Uh, we've got two benefits analysts. These people help to define the benefit of the tools that we're delivering, which has been really important to Network Rail. If they spend £190 million on delivering capabilities, they wanted to understand that they would receive back at least £190 million in benefits. Uh, that's both um, operational benefits, capital benefits, but also safety driven benefits as well. So removing those boots from ballast is a benefit that we're able to articulate. And then finally, we've got a business analyst uh, currently on there who's helping to define some of the scope around um, uh, one of the projects there. So uh, Aegis is really proud to have worked very closely with Network Rail um, on this project, uh, and we will be until the, the, the end of this current control period, which, as I said, is March uh, 2024. Um, and, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Martin, um, and thank you for an insightful presentation. Um, you know, just like a, a data lake, I don't know you know where to start. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> by its nature, so the question I have for you, and and probably to start there, and we'll go back to the, some of the questions that are on the chat box is, how do you avoid you know the going down the rabbit hole syndrome? Because you 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 you, it's very very easy to dive in there and get excited. I mean, I know th uh, five years back when I started with this process, I used to do that quite a lot and find myself lost in the rabbit hole. But how does one, as what do they call it, as leadership, uh, avoid going down the rabbit hole? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. The the key for me is defining um, the needs of uh, uh, of both the customer and the product 
up front and then making sure you're sticking to that vision. Uh, I'll give you a very brief example. We were delivering a decision support tool for, for stations, for railway stations. There's, of course, a lot of elements to stations um, and we were working with users and we defined a set of requirements. And then we met with a senior user one day who said, do you know what I'd really like is live access to the CCTV systems, to the cameras in all of the stations. So I, I challenged this and said, that's a really interesting requirement. How does that help you better manage your assets? Um, and after about 15 and 20 minutes of discussion, actually he admitted he just thought it'd be something fun to do at lunchtime whilst he was on his break would just to be watching the cameras of, of the passengers in the station. So, it, you know, there's lots of needs out there, but associating them with a benefit was really important because then you're able to make sure that you focus the capability on delivering that benefit. And that's one of the ways that we really help to uh, to, to stop going down those rabbit holes. Thank you for that. And I think this, this leads nicely to the issue of you know, the discussion about creating direct business benefits, something that you were talking about uh, right at the end. But could we link it to the issue of bringing the maintenance teams on board, you know, the actual user of the system on board? Because it's not only about, you know, the, the, the business, direct business benefits will talk to senior management, uh, but the direct benefits of day to day. Can we talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the, as we said, the, the maintenance teams are, are the real end users and we absolutely have to create a capability that works for them. Um, in the UK, and, I, and I'm pretty certain this will be the same in South Africa, our maintenance teams are, are massively overworked. You know, they, they probably have a list of 100 things that, that, they, that keeps them up at night and they need to do on a daily basis. Uh, and the reality is they don't have uh, either the people, the material or the funds to, to achieve everything they want to achieve. So the way we pitch our decision support tools to our end, maintenance end users in that space is we help them to prioritise their problems. So if you've got 100 issues, we help you to put them in order of criticality. And we can do that because we know better about the condition of our assets, the impact on performance and, and the impact on safety of the network. So we help to prioritise it. So that's benefit number one. Also, what we give is the is the ability to focus their efforts on those priority issues. So what's very important is that we're not taking away work for maintenance team at all. What we're doing is we're allowing the maintenance teams to do more of the more important or critical or safety work. So so that that really for me is is the big benefits pitch here uh, is that they continue to do as much work, but it is better prioritised and it's better located so that we can get the best value out of their inputs and our tools help those engineers to do that. And we found that really speaks to our maintenance teams uh, and really helps to bring them on that journey with us. Um, this isn't a replacement of a um, of a person doing a role at all. It is a support tool to help them to do more. Uh, focused and um, uh, benefit driven works. One of the slides that you had was uh, spoke uh, directly to the issue of integrating, um, you know, uh, legacy systems. Um, and when you're looking at that, uh, let's let's chat a little bit about that, because I know you, you know, you are used to this and explaining it, but then you showed clearly that, you know, there's a lot of legacy systems that are there with a, you know, digital infrastructure program, but you're not just getting rid of them you're bringing them on board to be able to make sure that they can work with the with a higher uh, method of extraction yeah that's absolutely right um some of the systems uh, we absolutely have had to um either upgrade or enhance or or indeed decommission altogether and replace that's just um that's it technology and and you know we've had to remove several old uh, what's known as green screen systems so very early sort of almost MS-DOS looking screen uh, type capabilities. We have had to remove those and replace those, but that's that's all par for the course. What's really important is that you take those legacy systems and you bring them into a common data environment so that the data, I like to think of it very much as a cube. So if you think of a big Rubik's cube, one of those toys that you can play around and you can mani manipulate the squares, you want your infrastructure data to look like a Rubik's cube. You want to be able to change it and move it and shift it to answer different questions for different audiences. Um, and that's what we allow when we bring our data into a common data environment we spatially align it. We make sure we're talking the same language. So, for example, different disciplines um, within engineering might have different terms for condition. We align those terms so that actually you can then start to manipulate that data cube to really make those decisions for you. And, and you have to bring all the systems on board with that, both the legacy and, and the new ones that you implement. 
it's a big task. Uh, it, there are hundreds of different systems um, uh, and that's why it's a five year program. There's a lot to achieve. David, thank you. And I uh, want to try and look in the chat box and see if we've got anything in there that uh, would be directly linked to this. And otherwise, we will deal with it in the general chat uh, later, Q&A and all. But um, the, the question here is that, you know, some of our systems are in decline and uh, the big challenge is just getting them ready now. Uh, you know, and, and, and the, the question is asking, do we actually have time to be able to put these systems in place uh, that are as, as complex as this? And, and, and probably my thoughts directly before you answer is that it, there is no other uh, way, uh, uh, other opportune time to do it than now, uh, and, and 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 therefore it is a, a time when we need to be able to do a lot of this work. In actual fact, uh, the decline has created a bit of an opportunity where we're not hard pressed. We are hard pressed to bring back a lot of lines in uh, into work, but it is a good time for us. But what are your thoughts about parallel uh, development of you know us bringing back the railway lines and then at the same time digitizing the railway lines? Well, first of all, digitization is not a one off program and uh, in, in, in railway and many large infrastructure organisations being of engineering heritage, we see it very much as we build something and then we walk away and, it, and it's left standing for 30, 40, 50 years and we have to do a little bit of maintenance. But, but that's not how IT and digital infrastructure works. It's an ongoing programme where we have to continuously develop and, and we might have these large scale programmes to get things up and running, but they must be transferred into business as usual to keep them ticking over. So first of all, I'd say it's not a one off process, it is continuous and, and technology evolves uh, uh, almost, you know, by every minute. And we must make sure that we keep up with that where suitable. Um, bring in new, bring in um, sort of either decommissioned lines or lines that have been mothballed back into service is absolutely the right time to look at the digitization. As you say, you have maybe a bit of a lull in passenger service. So you have the ability to take that time needed to make sure that the, the digital maintenance records are up to date, um, that we've captured everything geospatially uh, and have the right locations for equipment. Um, uh, so it's a really, really good time to do it. But as you said, there is no time like the present. And, and it's not a case of saying, well, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we won't do that. We'll come back in five years and look at it. In five years, technology would have evolved and we'll be on to the next round of data collection methodologies or data storage and that analytics. So, um, you know, there is the right time is always now. Um, the scale at which that's done is, of course, going to be dictated by funds available um, and the demands of the infrastructure. And you know, that, that's, that's something that needs to be developed very early on. And, and, and we've helped Network Route to do that in the UK when they were building up their, their initial business case. Thank you, David, and thank you for what they call it, for giving your, us your insights on, on these matters. I have so many other questions, but we, what do they call it? Let's, <laughs> let's continue the conversation and continue working on, on everything that has to be done. Um, we are now going to go on to the open forum for the Q&A, and if I could bring back the, um, all the presenters onto the screen so that we can then uh, deal with any questions that are either in the chat box or any questions that we could uh, uh, deal with directly. Uh, we've got a question here from Brandon Simpson, uh, somebody who I know very well, who uh, is asking, you know, how can we bring the general public to play better roles um, in order they call it in, in uh, managing our infrastructure? Is there any thoughts from anybody from international best practice? And if I could venture a thought on that uh, to start the conversation. I think, Brandon, it's about bringing on shared value. Um, one, of, one of the most important things that I, I probably learned from, um, you know, taking the train with the minister yesterday uh, from Pinar Sports to, uh, to, to, to the city centre of Pretoria was that on average, while the railway line was not there, um, the, the the passengers that were on there, because I, I was quite amazed that the railway line was reopening and then there were already queues and the trains were full just like that. And, and it was explained to me that on average, what you would pay to get uh, uh, on the train from uh, Pinarspur to the city centre, you'd pay 25% of what you would pay on any other mode of transport. Now, in essence, while the railway line was not there, uh, the people were really feeling the pain 
of paying 75% more than, in actual fact, a lot of them, uh, if you look at the general household survey in that area, they were working for transport, working for nothing else. They couldn't be able to pay for anything else. And, and I think it is these conversations that we need to start having about shared value and about why infrastructure is important to be able to make the lives of the people better. Um, but those are some of my thoughts from my end. Um, any thoughts from your end, Janil, as you, you know, you've been in the railways long enough uh, and then you've seen some challenges. Uh, how can we bring on the community to be able to support our efforts? Janil? Yes, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I think it's a complex uh, problem to solve, you know, we uh, and we need to look at this problem holistically. Um, we need to look at our our trans our transport systems holistically uh, and in 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 an integrated fashion. Um, uh, stakeholder management is quite important, as you mentioned, that you need to understand, um, you know, the, the people that you're going to serve, and um, household income, as you mentioned, is 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 an important consideration because you can't uh, price your 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 transport routes out of what your end user can can afford. So it's complex. It re, it it involves stakeholder management. It's it, it, it it's yeah. I don't think I have the answer, but um, you know it's uh, something to consider. Perhaps our colleagues at Aegis can perhaps share a case study. Well, I was, I was going to jump in. Yeah, I think um, we, we've done an interesting piece of work recently at Aegis doing some benchmarking across different um, complex um, international infrastructure projects. And what we've what we've noticed is the sort of the approach to infrastructure management is is quite conservative when it comes to um, community engagement and communications. Whereas if you look at society around us now, expectations have increased in terms of access to, to, to real time information, updates uh, and even information in terms of what's going on on a given transport network at a given time. When's it going to be closed? When's it going to be open? If it's closed, why is it closed, etc. So I think as a as an industry, there is a bit of a a catch up to do in terms of the level of of, of access we give to customers, consumers in terms of information around the infrastructure network and how it's managed and what's happening on that on that network. And I think there's a bit of a catch up to do in that uh, in that area and maybe a way we need to sort of change the kind of the contractual aspects around how infrastructure is managed to to you know, clearly to focus still on the sort of the harder engineering performance asset condition outcomes, but also sort of focus on some of the more communication and, and, and stakeholder engagement outcomes as well. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, and, and Martin, I think I want you to, to weigh in on this one, because now here we're talking in the stages where we're talking about data and how much data do we share when you start talking about open data and open uh, um, and all of that. And, you know, where do you go in, you know, the data that comes from the community and the data that comes from the network? How far, you know, I can hear somebody going there and saying, but if I share all the data, then I'll be highly exposed and be highly criticized for everything that I'm doing. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Come from what David has just said now? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, you'll often hear organisations refer to critical infrastructure, or they might have what they call golden assets. These are the, the really highly important parts of the network that if they fail, then, you know, the, the whole country comes to a standstill. Um, my, my view is that uh, there should definitely be more open data. I think having access to um, a whole communities of really smart um, uh, data driven um, uh, people uh, often coming out of university or maybe still in university, giving them access um, to data allows a new view on uh, on information. And uh, I think one of the quotes that Isabel came up at the very start of this um, presentation around Albert Einstein um, and that, you know, we can't possibly fix our problems with the same mindset that created them, then, then we have that same challenge here with data. So if an organisation has been in charge of its data for, since its, you know, conception, how is that organisation best placed to come up with um, 
uh, you know, uh, decisions and changes to how they use that data. I think if you make it open access, then you're allowing um, new people to come out from from new mindsets. And that also includes cross industry. So what you know, why wouldn't we allow someone from the nuclear industry to have a look at railway data and go, well, do you know what? Here's what I would do. Here's how I would interpret that um, and, and vice versa. So um, I think only good can come from data sharing and this mindset of, you know, sort of data criticality and sharing is dangerous, I think is a bit old fashioned, to be honest. And I think we need to move away from that. Before we start a revolution, Martin, uh, I need to ask Jerome a question. <laughs> I hear you, you're going there. Um, Jerome, talking about this communication issue and how do we bring it together back again to say, well, you started off saying to us, well, this must be linked to business objectives. And 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 how do we link up business objectives in us communicating our, our 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 asset management plan? And I think for me, my belief has always been: if you communicate with the uh, with the committers, that there's going to be a, a bit of an interruption because I need to fix the railway line to make it better for you. Um, then there might be a, a thought of acceptance. But what are your thoughts about communications and linking it back to what you said earlier on that an asset management plan must be linked back to what do they call it, to your business objectives? Yeah, I, I think that this, this communication is important because, um, as you mentioned before, uh, the cost of uh, transport infrastructures and railway infrastructure for the state and for the community is very is very high. And then uh, the, um, it, it, it leads us that what you said before, that the, the, the people uh, with the people usually do not pay what it costs to the community and the state has to um, bring more money to make the, the infrastructure sustainable. Um, today, I think that in all countries, in all, on all continents, we are more in a move that uh, the the budget and the fundings are going to are going uh, down, and uh, we have each time less and less uh, less and less uh, fund, funds, and uh, it will lead us to um, certainly situations that are not uh, uh, optimal. Uh, for uh, the condition of our assets, and it will lead us to postpone some intervention and that kind of things. If we want the person, the public, all the shareholders and all the community to understand what is going on, we have to share uh, these issues, we have to share these objectives and so that the people see that uh, we, the railway industry, are not doing that because we think it's not important. It is just that we have a big problem, which is to prioritize all the, the expenses, all the expenses, uh, to try to, uh, in the context of few funds, how to maintain the best level of quality service as possible, which will not be the best that could be imagined, but which is the best that we can afford. And for that, sharing objectives, explaining that we are setting, uh, we, we are doing that work to prioritize and to do the best that we can with all the constraints that we have, with all the, the, the constraints internally and externally as the COVID. Uh, Janil talked about a holistic view, and I think this is what is important. We have to have this holistic, this holistic view. We have to share it through our strategic asset man management plan and its objectives. And so this is the only way that maybe the public could understand uh, about that. Thank you, Jerome. Um, the closure of the session is not mine to do, but uh, Isabella will do all of that. And uh, all that's left for me from dealing with the session is that I think Jerome told us that we needed to, you know, co connect the, your asset management planning with your business objectives. And yeah. uh, from David's side, he told us that, look, you got to bring the leadership on board and communicate adequately around the, uh, uh, the business and be careful of uh, fatigue management. Um, Overall, uh, from Martin's end, Martin's said data, data, and data, and there will be new jobs that what do they call it that will appear that will make sure that we uh, we move forward. But you, you you cannot afford not to start. You have to start uh, right now. Janil said there was challenges, but we have uh, achieved something throughout all of that. And all that is left for me is to say thank you, guys. Um, the world gets better when men do things uh, for other people and they start planting trees that they will not sit in their shade.
or start digging wells that what they call will never ever quench their thirst. You have contributed greatly to my country and to everything else that we do here. And uh, in our nations of our railway land, we will forever be grateful for what you have brought us through today. Um, thank you and back to you, Isabella. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a riveting, uh, informative, uh, and, and grabbing discussion. I live very intelligent and I'm sure most of you uh, are very rich with uh, information and ideas and experiences that we've learned uh, from our international team. Um, we started with asking ourselves, what are the opportunities and challenges that we face as an industry in rail asset management in South Africa? Um, Dr. Ma uh, Professor Marianne painted a, the picture very well. It is a picture of uh, a, a, a pressing need uh, to combine our efforts as the private sector with government to drive uh, freight, uh, you know, uh, back to the rails. And uh, we also, I think in Janine's presentation, we are very alive to the challenges that we face as an industry in South Africa. But from the case studies that we've had today, I am very confident about the future. And I think for the, from our poll that we ran earlier, 83% of uh, our participants are very upbeat about the direction that our government is taking in terms of the policy frameworks. Some are worried about the implementation capacity, but hey, we are here as the private sector to team up with our government uh, to bring these solutions to bear. So I'm very glad that uh, we know more about EGIS. Uh, a lot of people may, know, no, may not know about Aegis being a new player in, uh, in our shores. They only joined South Africa uh, two years ago, but it feels like they've been here for a very long time. Uh, so we are very uh, comforted that we have partners in this long journey uh, of resuscitating and repositioning our rail industry in South Africa. We have the commitment, we have the brains, we have uh, the commit, the will, uh, to make things work. And I think if we partner with people like Aegis and uh, many other uh, like-minded organizations around the world, uh, the future is great uh, for South Africa. Uh, I know Laurent being the CEO and country manager of, uh, of South Africa, uh, is very passionate about this subject. Uh, he, uh, he, he always says that, you know, in discussions like this, we need to understand that uh, asset management is not the point of departure uh, is not the end, uh, but the point of departure uh, of infrastructure development in South Africa. So I really believe that we have, we have come to the end of the beginning of a new chapter and a journey together as an industry uh, where we are going to meet regularly, but not to just talk, but to help uh, the different role players uh, in government, uh, in our provinces, you know, uh, everyone that that is responsible uh, in various ways uh, to make our rail transport system work. We are here to partner and to give ideas that work. So it remains for us to say uh, we apologize for the time that ran, uh, ran over, but we have also learned that uh, important discussions like this that are so very topical and relevant uh, to us as South Africa. We just can't, you know, whisk through quickly and uh, we are very hungry uh, to learn. So thank you so much to my co-navigator, uh, Tsepo, for lifting out uh, salient and pertinent issues out of uh, the different sections that were presented here today. And uh, so you did a very good job, my brother. So uh, thank you so much. So I'd like to thank the rest of the panel. Uh, David, we are very keen to uh, get um, learned about this uh, ISO uh, 55001. Uh, as an industry, we know that it is a beginning of a journey to uh, help us to become better and get to global standards in terms of how we do work. Uh, Jerome, we have learned that this is possible from the work that we have done. Uh, we've learned from the case studies that we've presented and we have uh, listened very carefully in terms of the methodologies and the approaches, mix mixing the soft and the hard in terms of 
uh, making these things happen. So we are very grateful and uh, for your contribution. Uh, Martin, while we are in the, in the exponential world, my brother, this is a world where we have to make use of technology and make it work for us. And uh, we almost have to leapfrog as South Africans. We have to deal with the very basic mundane issues uh, of yesterday that, are, that don't require technology. Uh, paper systems, but we have to leapfrog uh, if we want to become uh, part of the top tier uh, in the rail sphere uh, across the world. Otherwise, we will surely be disintermediated uh, because the world is looking for uh, organizations or industries or countries that are uh, more intelligent, that are uh, organ uh, countries that uh, are more efficient, countries that are more competent uh, in terms of uh, their delivery uh, of services, products and services. So we thank uh, uh, Aegis uh, wholeheartedly. We thank uh, SAISI wholeheartedly as well. It is a partnership that is uh, amazing. Uh, two great organizations that are respected uh, in the industry and uh, in the infrastructure space and, uh, and definitely will be helping us to navigate this journey uh, going forward. So we thank everyone as well who has joined this conversation uh, this morning. Uh, we would have hoped for a more robust uh, discussion. Uh, I failed to indicate, I must apologize, that we would give people a mic and unmute them. So next time we will definitely attend to that. Uh, but we really appreciate everyone that made comments in the chat box. And uh, we thank uh, all of you for making today happen. So what is next? This is not the end of the conversation. As I indicated at the, at the beginning, this is the first of a series of rail dialogue, uh, rail dialogues. So we look forward to seeing you again in early 2023. Uh, Laurent has indicated, I think, and the, and the, and the, and the team have indicated that uh, we should pencil uh, end of February or beginning of March. So we look forward to the next conversation, but between these conversations, let us know what should be different because we don't want uh, chat, uh, you know, just talk shops. Uh, there are many of those in South Africa. Uh, we want implementation of uh, ideas. We want to ensure that our industry is moving forward because there's a lot of catching up to do. So there will be a survey that will be sent through tomorrow uh, by the CIC team, we encourage everyone that has been part of this session to kindly participate in that survey. Let us know what has worked. We know that we messed up a bit with time, and uh, I think I, I, I'm a culprit there uh, right at the beginning. I'm sure that step of being our efficient COO, uh, I've got a one or two things to learn there, so we'll definitely do better next time. Uh, so help us to know what uh, we should also be covering, the topics that you would like to hear uh, on this uh, platform uh, as we journey into 2023. And uh, so thank you so very much, everyone. And uh, thank you, Janil, once again, David, uh, Lauren. Yes, Professor Marianne earlier I'll be doing uh, political mistakes here, but everybody is acknowledged. And uh, I thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity for allowing us to navigate this session. And, uh, and I'm sure that things will be even much slicker next time. And uh, so thank you very much and uh, God bless. <laughs>